If you miss the days when engines just didn't break, when you could count on a million miles without major headaches, you're not alone. Hell, you're part of a pretty big club of drivers and mechanics who remember when things were simpler. Picture this. A 1,992 Cat 3406 b that's still pulling loads today, 30 plus years later. Or a Detroit Series 60 from the late 90s with over a million miles that starts every morning like it's brand new. These weren't unicorns. This was normal. Now compare that to some of the nightmares we've dealt with in the last 20 years. Engines that need major work before they hit 500. Zero miles. Systems so complicated that a simple sensor failure can leave you dead on the side of the highway. Today, we're going to tell you the truth about what happened. How well-meaning emission laws ended up killing some of the most legendary, bulletproof engines ever built. And why some of the cleanest engines in history turned out to be the biggest headaches truckers have ever faced. By the end of this video, you'll understand exactly how we went from engines that ran forever to engines that sometimes feel like they're designed to fail. And trust me, it's not the story you think at Island. The Golden Age of Engines Let's talk about the Golden Age, the era when engines were built to last, not built to pass emissions tests. The Caterpillar 3406B, built from 1987 to 1993, was basically indestructible. We're talking about an engine that truckers still hunt down today because they know it'll outlast whatever new thing is sitting on the dealer lot. Same story with the original Detroit Series 60, and I mean the real Series 60 from 1987 to 2002, not the complicated mess they call by that name today. Then you had the Cummins N14 from 1991 to 2000, power and simplicity in one package, and the Mac E7 and E-Tech engines that just kept chugging along year after year with basic maintenance. What made these engines so damn reliable? Simple. They were actually simple. Mechanical injection systems like the legendary P7100 pump on the Cummins. No maze of sensors waiting to throw codes. No computer trying to outsmart basic physics. Just solid engineering focused on one thing, making power and lasting forever. These engines had one job, move freight. They weren't worried about NOx levels or particulate counts. They were designed by engineers who understood that in the real world, Uptime matters more than test bench numbers, and the results spoke for themselves. Million-mile engines weren't rare, they were expected. Guys would buy a truck, run it for 20 years, and hand it down to their sons. Try doing that with what's rolling off the assembly line today. The beginning of the end, 1,998. Now, here's where everything started going sideways. 1,998. Remember that year, because it's when the truck industry got turned upside down. The EPA discovered that pretty much every major engine manufacturer was using what they called defeat devices, basically software that made engines run cleaner during emissions testing, then switched to different programming for real-world driving. Detroit Diesel, Caterpillar, Cummins, Volvo, Mac, Navistar, AI, all of them got caught with their hands in the cookie jar the government came down hard. We're talking about an 83.4 million fine, Massive money back in 98. But here's the kicker. It wasn't just about paying up. The EPA forced these companies into what they called consent decrees, basically agreements that completely changed how fast they had to clean up their engines. Before 1998, engine development happened gradually. You'd design something, test it in the field for years, work out the bugs, then maybe think about the next step. That's how you got those bulletproof engines we just talked about. After 1,998, the government said, you've got these deadlines and you better hit them or else. No more taking your time. No more extensive field testing. You've got dates on the calendar and your engines better pass those emissions tests whether they're ready or not. And that's when everything changed. The whole mentality shifted from, let's build something that works forever to let's build something that passes the test. And guess what happens when you rush engineering? You get engines that work great on paper and fall apart in the real world. 2002 to 2006, the first disasters. And here's where the wheels came off the wagon. 
2002 hit, and suddenly, engines that had been rock solid for decades turned into nightmares overnight. Take the Detroit Series 60. Before 2002, this was one of the most dependable engines on the road. Millions of happy drivers, mechanics who knew how to work on them, and a reputation you could bank on. Then 2002 rolled around, and Detroit had to add EGR, exhaust gas recirculation, to meet the new emission standards. Same name, Series 60, but it might as well have been a completely different engine. EGR cooler failures became routine. Carbon buildup started choking engines, overheating issues that the old Series 60 never had. Drivers who'd sworn by Detroit for years suddenly found themselves broken down more often than they were rolling. But Detroit wasn't alone in this mess. Caterpillar launched their ACERT engine in 2003, Advanced Combustion Emission Reduction Technology. Sounded impressive, right? It was supposed to replace the legendary 3406E, which was about as bulletproof as engines got. Reality check. ACERT turned into one of the biggest disasters in trucking history. Oil pump failures, injector problems, reliability issues that made grown men cry. The engine was so bad that Caterpillar, a company that had been building truck engines since the 1930s, basically gave up on the on-highway market. Think about that for a second. Cummins wasn't immune either. Their ISX replaced the beloved N14 in 2002 and early versions were plagued with EGR problems and sensor failures. To Cummins' credit, they kept working on it and eventually got it sorted out, but it never quite had that bulletproof reputation of the N14. This is when truckers started learning a hard lesson. Just because it had the same badge didn't mean it was the same engine. 2007-2009 The DPF, Apoclepes. Just when you thought things couldn't get worse, 2007 showed up and said, hold my beer. This is when they introduced the DPF, diesel particulate filter, diesel particulate, and basically strapped a furnace to every diesel engine in America. Here's what a DPF actually does. It collects soot from your exhaust, then burns it off at over 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. Think about that. Your engine is now carrying around a device that regularly runs hotter than most ovens. What could possibly go wrong? The active regeneration process meant your engine would inject extra fuel to get that filter hot enough to burn off the soot. So not only are you carrying around this complicated system, but it's literally burning extra fuel just to clean itself. Your fuel economy? Kiss it goodbye. And if you were running local routes, stop and go traffic, anything that didn't get the exhaust hot enough for natural regeneration? Forget about it. That DPF would clog up faster than a cheap air filter and you'd be stuck with a truck that barely moved until you could get it regenerated. The problems were immediate and brutal. Cat's already troubled ACERT engines became even worse nightmares. Detroit launched their new DD-15 with all the promise in the world, but it came loaded with DPF issues right out of the gate. Cummins ISX owners found themselves dealing with yet another layer of complexity on top of engines that were already more complicated than they needed to be. And Max MP8? Let's just say it didn't exactly set the reliability bar high. But here's the real cost nobody talks about. Downtime. Trucks sitting in shop bays waiting for DPF repairs. Drivers stuck on the side of the road because the regen system failed. Operating costs that went through the roof. Because now you had to maintain what was basically a high temperature furnace attached to your engine. This wasn't just an inconvenience. This was an industry-wide disaster that cost truckers billions. Why did this happen? So why did this disaster happen? Here's the truth that makes politicians and bureaucrats uncomfortable. The EPA set emission targets based on political goals, not engineering reality. They looked at a calendar, picked some dates, and said, make it happen. <laughs> Meanwhile, the engineers were saying, that's not enough time to do this right. And nobody wanted to listen. Manufacturers got boxed into an impossible corner. Miss those deadlines and you can't sell engines, period. So what choice did they have? Rush half-baked technology to market and hope they could fix the problems later. That's how you get engines released before they're ready. Here's the fundamental problem that nobody wanted to acknowledge. Diesel combustion naturally produces NOx and soot. It's basic physics. You can reduce one or the other, but trying to eliminate both at the same time, 
That requires compromises, and those compromises usually mean complexity, and complexity means things break. Instead of solving the root problem, which would have required revolutionary technology and lots of time, everybody just kept adding band-aids. EGR systems, DPF filters, SCR systems, more sensors, more computers, each one trying to fix what the previous system couldn't handle. The incentives were all wrong from the start. Engine manufacturers got paid for compliance, not reliability. As long as their engines passed the emission tests, they got to sell them. What happened after that? Not the EPA's problem. Fleets and owner-operators, they were stuck buying whatever was legal, whether it worked or not. You need a truck, you buy what's available. And the EPA? Zero accountability for real-world performance. They set the rules and walked away, leaving truckers to deal with the consequences. That's how you end up with a whole generation of engines that were great on paper and disasters in the real world. The survivors and lessons. Now, to be fair, some manufacturers eventually figured it out. It just took them a decade and billions of dollars in warranty claims to get there. Cummins finally got it right with the X-15. It's not perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than those early ISX disasters. They stuck with it, kept improving it, and now it's actually a decent engine that most drivers can live with. Detroit's DD-15 and DD-16 are night and day compared to those early versions. They learned from their mistakes, improved the systems, and now they've got engines that don't leave drivers stranded nearly as often. Volvo took a solid engineering approach with their D13. They didn't rush it. They didn't overcomplicate it. And it shows. It's become one of the more reliable emission-compliant engines on the road. But some never recovered. Caterpillar's ACERT was such a disaster that CAT basically gave up on the on-highway truck market entirely a company that had been building truck engines since the 1930s just walked away. That should tell you how bad things got. Max MP series? Still problematic after all these years. Some engines just never got sorted out properly. Here's what the industry learned the hard way. More development time equals better reliability. Shocking concept, right? Gradual implementation works better than rushed government mandates and real-world testing beats lab compliance every single time. But the price of learning these lessons was enormous. We're talking billions in warranty costs, destroyed reputations, and millions of unhappy customers who got stuck with the bill while manufacturers figured out how to build engines again. The crazy thing is, most of this pain could have been avoided with realistic timelines and proper development cycles, but that would have required politicians to admit they didn't understand engineering. So here we are. Looking back at over two decades of emission regulations and their impact on trucking, what did we lose and what did we gain? What we lost was legendary. We lost simplicity, engines you could understand and fix with basic tools. We lost that bulletproof reliability that made million-mile engines normal instead of miraculous. We lost lower operating costs and engines that just worked day after day, year after year. And maybe most importantly, we lost trust between manufacturers and the people who actually use these engines. But let's be honest about what we gained too. The air is measurably cleaner. That's not opinion, that's fact. Modern engines, when they're working properly, do get better fuel economy. And the technology advances, while sometimes a double-edged sword, have brought genuine improvements in some areas. Here's the hard truth that nobody wants to say out loud. Environmental progress was real and necessary. Nobody wants to go back to the days when truck exhaust could choke you at a traffic light. But the way these regulations were implemented was rushed and costly, and it created an entire generation of unreliable engines that cost the industry billions and left drivers stranded on highways across America. The emission laws weren't wrong. Cleaner air matters, and we all live in the same environment. But the way they were implemented killed some of the best engines ever made and turned trucking into a technological nightmare for over a decade. The real question is, could it have been done better? Could we have gotten cleaner air without sacrificing reliability? I think we could have, with realistic timelines and proper development cycles. What's your experience with pre-emission versus modern engines? Have you driven both? Worked on both? Are you one of those guys still hunting for a good pre-emission truck? Or have you made peace with the modern stuff? Share your stories in the comments below. I want to hear from the people who actually live with these engines every day.